All right. Hi, everybody. So that was actually a good uh, introduction because I was talking about open hardware in uh, primary and secondary schools, and I'll be focusing on uh, university education. Let's see which slide I should Can I click here. All right, in 2009, I was a college senior studying mechanical engineering, and I had never used a microcontroller or even heard the name Arduino. But nonetheless, uh, for our senior projects lab, my partner and I decided that we would try to build a robot that could find and collect tennis balls on a tennis court. Ambitious. Uh, we had a limited budget, but National Instruments uh, donated a single board Rio microcontroller for us to use for the project. So how did it go? Well, actually, not very well. As is the case for many who build hardware projects for the first time, we ran into many obstacles along the way um, and didn't get nearly as far as we'd hoped to by the end of the semester. With limited examples available for this proprietary hardware and no community whatsoever to speak of, it was difficult to get started programming the board, and the addition of each new feature along the way was painstaking and slow. Furthermore, NI had not yet released the drivers for the camera that we were using, um, so we were unable to deploy our vision algorithms onto the hardware. And the size and the cost of the board meant that we could only uh, work on the project while we were in the lab. Um, then finally, to top it all off, toward the end of the semester, I accidentally fried the board by putting it down on a metal surface, and uh, it was too costly to replace and buy another one, so we had to write our final report based on the progress that we'd made up to that point. Uh, we never actually managed to get a working robot. All right, now many of you can probably imagine how my experience would be different if I'd attempted this project today instead of in 2009. With low-cost microcontrollers and components and widely available drivers for every type of hardware and thriving communities of people uh, creating and sharing examples, um, most of these obstacles would have been eliminated. I could have taken my hardware home with me um, and spent my days and nights perfecting my vision algorithm or building a mechanical subsystem instead of struggling with simple tasks like just getting my computer to recognize the board. Oh, sorry. So after graduating from university, I began working at MathWorks. And in the time that I've been there, we've established a new global team of engineers whose sole responsibility is to support uh, university professors who are interested in using our software for teaching. We've also instituted a company-wide priority to support hardware for education, and we've built over 80 hardware support packages. And for the past two years, I've worked as product marketing manager for teams that build uh, MATLAB support for Arduino and other low-cost hardware platforms. So all of this is to say that I've had ample opportunity to talk with academics and learn about the impact of open hardware movement on engineering programs. All right, so that brings us to my title slide. Uh, the landscape of hardware has shifted significantly since my time in university. Uh, so let's take an, a look at how we got to where we are today and also look at the key role that open hardware has played and continues to play uh, in university engineering curriculum. In 2005, Arduino was invented. This microcontroller board was unique in a couple of ways. Instead of being designed for robotic students, it was designed with artists and designers in mind. Right? Instead of being powerful and complex, it was designed to be cheap and easy to use. And it was one of the earliest examples of hardware designs being released under an open license Right, so that anyone could buy the raw components and assemble one of these boards. The lower cost and significant ease of use allowed, uh, enabled Arduino to catch on quickly with new communities of users. New revisions of the board were created and new variants offered more power or a different form factor. And the popularity of Arduino both fed and was fed by the growth of a new tech-focused DIY culture called the maker movement which is differentiated from previous DIY movements in a focus on new technologies for creation, such as 3D fabrication tools and microcontrollers. And each year of the past decade has seen growth in the numbers of worldwide uh, community makerspaces and maker fairs. Now, before Arduino, the Parallax basic stamp was the microcontroller of choice for teaching robotics. A proprietary board with narrow appeal and no community outside of education, it was quickly eclipsed by the more abstracted Arduino. Google Trends shows that searches for Arduino surpassed searches for basic stamp in about 2007 and have since grown to a level many times larger. And you'll see a cyclic pattern of searches over the past six years or so, which indicates heavy use in academia with more searches during the school year than during the summer months. Meanwhile, smartphones took off during the same period with the first iPhone introduced in 2007. And competition among the major smartphone manufacturers drove down the prices of sensors like accelerometers and gyroscopes and connectivity modules like Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Electronics manufacturing skyrocketed in Shenzhen, China, making all manner of components widely available and cheap. 
And websites that sell low-cost hardware then grew in support of the maker movement. Um, I've only listed a couple here. But services to produce cheap custom printed circuit boards also popped up. And we actually designed this PCB as just a quick way to illustrate the behavior of RC circuits. Um, but it was designed in an afternoon. We ordered a batch of 30 boards, and they arrived fully assembled in a matter of weeks for under $6 per board. So imagine doing this 10 years ago. Now, the open source nature of Arduino has allowed others to expand on their designs, creating boards for niche applications. Bitolino is an open hardware board based on Arduino that can capture biometric signals and then send them over Bluetooth to a computer or a mobile device. It's being used at universities around the world for prototyping uh, medical devices and wearable electronics. And Bitolino provides a native software environment, but we've also created a MATLAB interface uh, because, we wanted user, or because users wanted to be able to do more um, with the signals that they were acquiring, more analysis types of things. Now, some new open hardware boards don't leverage the Arduino ecosystem at all. The ADLM 1000 board from Analog Devices uh, is a source measure unit that can simultaneously source and sync current and voltage on the same pin um, at 100 kilohertz. And so this can replace expensive data acquisition cards uh, in courses like circuits courses and electronics courses. And at $40, it's cheap enough that every student can have one and take one home. And this board also has a MATLAB interface to enable more advanced analysis, such as this example, which estimates a filter's transfer, transfer function. All right, so this brings us up to the present and the wide availability of tools, services, and resources for really anyone who wants to explore hardware or use it in their engineering courses. Now, one big change in the past five years or so is that all students are now getting experience with microcontrollers. A Stanford postdoc I spoke with told me that you'd be hard-pressed to find a third-year student today who hasn't touched an Arduino uh, by their third year. Uh, and many of the freshman seminars are actually giving them out to every student. One example is at Ohio State, where all engineering students are getting hands-on Arduino experience in their first semester. The freshman Fundamentals of Engineering course culminates in a final project to control a model train set with LEDs and servos and sensors, all from an Arduino. The students are taught programming fundamentals in, Mat in MATLAB. They use a MATLAB simulation to test their control algorithms when they're not in the lab. And they run their algorithms on the real hardware over a live connection to MATLAB at the end of the course. So uh, the key here really is that universities like Ohio State are trying to introduce practical engineering experiences earlier in their curriculum to get students excited and interested in engineering and spark their interest to inspire them to stick with their engineering programs um, and curriculum and their uh, more theoretical courses later on. Right, and another way that universities are trying to keep students more engaged with hands-on engineering is by hosting hackathon competitions. So these tend to involve more multidisciplinary projects, or problems rather, and bring together engineering students from different disciplines or sometimes even non-engineers um, to solve problems. Earlier this year, there was a hackathon in Peru uh, at a university in Peru uh, focused on tackling environmental issues. And the winning team used Arduinos in a wireless sensor network uh, to be able to detect illegal mining operations in the Amazon rainforest. Uh, they took measurements of water quality or, and uh, water contaminants, pH levels, um, and sound levels, uh, which can all be indicators of mining activity. And these measurements were sent up to ThinkSpeak, which is Internet, an Internet of Things data aggregator, and analyzed in MATLAB. And then automatic al alerts were sent when illegal operations were detected. In addition to hackathons, another trend in universities is the establishment of um, university-run makerspaces. These often serve the dual purpose of providing tools for students working on personal projects and creating a lab space for classes with a heavy making component. And the Citrus Invention Lab at Berkeley is a great example of this. As of this year, any student in the university can purchase a maker pass to access the lab. And classes on critical making and interactive device design um, also operate in this lab space, and these classes are heavily sought after by uh, engineering and art and humanities students. Um, and they go beyond just creating robot robots. They're about um, allowing students to explore creative um, product designs and explore the way we interact with the world around us. So this 3D printed skirt uses an Arduino to push people away when they get too close, critiquing notions of personal space. This cuddly pet uh, curls into a ball, and it only uncurls when the embedded capacitive sensors detect you stroking it, um, and it can provide support for kids with emotional problems. But it's not just hackathons and makerspaces and project-focused courses uh, that are introducing students to open hardware. Traditional theory courses are using low-cost hardware labs to connect theory to practice. So John Hendrigan's dynamic optimization class at BYU 
Okay, I see the five minute warning, thank you. Um, John Hendrigan's dynamic optimization class at BYU includes a lab where students implement a model predictive controller on an Arduino. And the goal here is to adjust the power of a heating element so that the measured temperature at a nearby temperature sensor is controlled to a set point. Right? It's basically a process control um, approach. And only limited programming skills are required for this class uh, because students can use high-level languages like MATLAB and an abstracted interface to communicate with the Arduino. So they don't need to spend half the class teaching people to program. And the lab kit consists of cheap and widely available electronics components that you can buy anywhere, and the necessary code and materials are shared online through the course website, the MATLAB Central File Exchange, and YouTube. Now at RPI, Joshua Hurst uses an exciting hardware demo to inspire his students to want to learn mechatronics. So students see his DC motor control demo and they're blown away, right? And what they do is they ask him, how does that work? How do you do that? Right? And so, um, this is great because for him, the students are now the ones that are asking the questions, and they're excited and they want to learn um, how this works. They want to learn the theory. So for him, that's a success. Do we get to the next slide? All right, we can just get to the end of the video. All right, here we go. All right, so this is the kit that he uses. It's a MinSeg kit, and it uses an Arduino with an added Bluetooth and uh, Bluetooth module and a Lego motor and a battery pack and it uses a control algorithm developed in Simulink's block diagram interface so students can focus on just applying the theory rather than um, debugging in C. And as with the Bitolino device I showed earlier, um, this kit builds off the Arduino platform to create an application specific hardware device. All right, and finally, Professor Allison Okamura at Stanford uh, takes open hardware labs a step further. Uh, her group has developed an Arduino-based kit for teaching haptics, which is human-machine interaction through the sense of touch. Um, and because her advanced control design course, course already uses MATLAB and Simulink for simulation, uh, it's easy to uh, use these same tools uh, to uh, program the hardware and connect theory to practice that way. But in addition to her Stanford, using the kit for her Stanford courses, uh, she's actually created a free, uh, self-paced, open to everybody, massive open online course. Um, on introduction to haptics. And so in, in order for any student or instructor around the world to be able to get access to this, this hardware, um, she's made all the hardware design files available, including the shape files for that 3D printed paddle on the front. And the circuit board on it can also be bought fully assembled from Seed Studio. So in this way, the accessibility and the shareability of open hardware is actually enabling new models and new ways of doing um, education. All right, so this is my last slide. Um, these case studies have all come from my experience, so you probably noticed many of them involve the use of MATLAB and Simulink. Uh, but many of the benefits of hardware, um, of open hardware and engineering courses are the same regardless of your programming environment of choice. Right? In makerspaces, hackathons, and project-based lab courses, open hardware is giving students the tools and giving students hands-on experience to put theory to practice and inspiring them to want to know how things work. It's allowing them to, to spend their time understanding the concepts rather than struggling with debugging microcontrollers. And the rich communities of support and online examples really lower the barrier to entry and they allow students to see that any of their ideas are possible. So if you know a professor or maybe if you are a professor or a student or just a lifelong learner, um, you in the audience are probably already you know, playing with this stuff, but I encourage you to, to share Arduinos and other open hardware with your friends um, who you know and encourage them to get them to start tinkering. Thank you very much.